The Christmas season, it's the most wonderful time of the year. It's a time we get to bust out the eggnog and share our beloved traditions with our friends and family. From leaving cookies out for Santa, to Advent, card sending, gift giving, and caroling, Christmas has become a time of elaborate traditions. From very conventional to very quirky, how much do we really know about our Christmas traditions? The things we do year after year can often be shrouded in a bit of mystery, like the Christmas tradition of hiding brooms in Norway, or building a giant goat out of hay in Sweden, or having Krampus parades in Austria. Time honored or just started, the traditions we celebrate have an origin somewhere in the celebration of the birth of Jesus. From our nativity set on our mantle to the singing of a Christmas carol, somewhere this month in history, someone is responsible for bringing our most beloved Christmas traditions to life. Between the crazy window displays and the fake North Pole with the mall Santa, somebody builds the seasonal nativity scene depicting that holy night of Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. We've all seen it. The small wood shelter of barn animals, the three wise men with their gifts, Mary, Joseph, and of course, baby Jesus laying in the manger. The nativity scene is perhaps the most recognized Christmas symbol around the world, coming in all shapes and sizes. In this time of year, from the White House to your house, it's on display practically everywhere. But how did this sentimental Christmas icon begin? Interestingly enough, the tradition traces all the way back to the 13th century, with one of the most famous saints in history, this month in history, St. Francis of Assisi began one of the most time-honored traditions, creating a public nativity scene. In Italy, in 1223, St. Francis created a live interactive nativity exhibition for public display. St. Francis hoped to create a meaningful worship experience for viewers and worshipers. The first display utilized a simple straw-filled manger as an altar with a live ox and donkey. This simple live production created a visual moment of contemplation for worshipers to reminisce about the birth of Jesus. Since this first illustrated sermon, similar exhibitions began popping up all around the world. Francesco of Assisi was an Italian Catholic preacher and a designated patron saint of Italy. Even though he spent his life as a humble priest, he was born into a very wealthy family. Francis' father was a clothes merchant and a wealthy business owner. Growing up, St. Francis lived the extravagant life of a wealthy young man, adorning fine clothes, eating the best food, and spending money without a care in the world. In 1201, at just 19 years old, Francesco joined the military. His military campaign proved tragic, and after being injured on the battlefield, he became a prisoner of war. While he was in prison for about a year, St. Francis began to change. According to his writings, it was in prison where he had his revelations. St. Francis forsook the material pleasures and rewards of life and began to dedicate his life to Christ and the essential teachings of the Gospels. Upon his return home, St. Francis lost his taste for the wealthy world where he once lived and began to seek spiritual enlightenment. During his conversion experience, he heard Christ speak to him and say, Francis, go and repair my house, which as you can see, is falling into ruins. This vision of Christ gave Francis a clear mission. His conversion was so dramatic that he returned home. It said he undressed publicly, and while standing in the town square completely naked, gave his expensive clothing back to his father. In fact, he gave all of his wealth away. He vowed to embrace a life of poverty, chastity, and to rely completely on the kindness of others. He devoted the rest of his life to Christ and the church. From that day forward, St. Francis spent much of his time in prayer and meditation. Gradually, Francis began to attract other young people to join his spiritual fervor and discard their positions. Initially, Francis and his band of brothers operated outside the traditional church structure. This caused concern among local bishops and powerful magistrates because St. Francis' influence began to grow. In order to appease the hierarchy, Francis decided to visit the Vatican in Rome and try to talk with the Pope. Much to everyone's surprise, Francis succeeded in not only meeting the Pope, but gaining approval for a new order based on the principles of poverty and the spirit of the Gospels, the Franciscans. With the Pope's approval, St. Francis was able to grow his mission. 
He and his fellow brothers traveled all across Italy and Europe, founding spiritual communities based on the teachings of their new order. Their Franciscan mission was to spread the gospel. Their primary message was that Christ came humbly to earth to free them from the cares of this world. This inspired Francis to reach people in a new way. In 1223, as an example of Christ's humble beginnings, St. Francis set up the first known nativity scenes at Griccio, near Assisi. With live animals positioned around the manger inside a cave, St. Francis believed that people needed to see the humble birth of the Messiah in order to appreciate the humble life God called his disciples to live. With the Christ child positioned in a bed of hay amongst the stable animals, the first live nativity scene was created. People in the small mountain village could see firsthand the humble beginnings of the babe of Bethlehem. Later, he told a friend his reasoning to create the first nativity scene in his town. I want to do something that will recall the memory of that child who was born in Bethlehem, to see with bodily eyes the inconveniences of his infancy, how he lay in the manger, and how the ox and ass stood by. St. Francis displayed the scene as it was believed to have happened on the first Christmas night. These visual aids helped the citizens of Grecio experience how Christ came into the world with simplicity and poverty. The same perspective St. Francis lived his life by, simple, poverty-centered spirituality. St. Francis once said, do all you can to preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. By setting up the nativity scene, St. Francis did just that. Now the nativity scene is displayed in virtually every aspect of the holiday season. From Christmas cards to lawn ornaments, the iconic stable image has become one of the most important Christmas traditions during the holiday season, all thanks to St. Francis of Assisi. Christmas tree, oh Christmas tree. Another unmistakable holiday image is the Christmas tree. Going out as a family, chopping it down or picking one out, and decorating it has been a beloved tradition for centuries. But its earliest origins were a little bit different than our tradition today. The earliest account starts in the 1500s, predating the use of the phrase Christmas tree and even the use of trees themselves. In many towns across Europe, especially in early English towns. There was wide use of the Maypole, a large pole erected in the center of a town that would be used to celebrate summer festivals. During the wintertime, these poles would be decorated and wrapped in holly and ivy. This is widely believed to be the precursor to the Christmas tree. Even in the 1500s, there were myths surrounding the origins of the Christmas tree. But one of the most popular throughout Europe was the legend of St. Boniface. His story, starts in the 8th century. Around the year 723, Boniface took on the task ordered by the Pope to evangelize part of modern-day Germany. The legend says that during his travels, he was told of a pagan community that, during the wintertime, would make human sacrifices to the thunder god Thor. This ritual would take place at the base of their sacred oak tree called the Thunder Oak. Boniface decided to intervene. He planned to destroy the Thunder Oak not only to prevent the human sacrifice, but also to show the pagans that he would not be struck down by lightning at the hands of their god. As the legend goes, Boniface and his companions reached the village on Christmas Eve, arriving in time to interrupt the ritual. Boniface approached the pagan crowd with his staff in hand and said, Here is the Thunder Oak. The cross of Christ shall break the hammer of the false god Thor. There was a small child laid out for the sacrifice. The executioner raised his hammer to strike the child, but Boniface extended his staff, blocking the blow. It shattered the executioner's hammer, saving the child's life. Boniface then picked up an ax, and as legend has it, took one swing at the tree and knocked it down, roots and all. The tree was broken in four pieces. Afterwards, Boniface had a chapel built from this wood. As cool as this legend is, the main focus of the story lay just beyond the fallen thunder oak. Boniface looked around and pointed to a small, unassuming fir tree, saying, This little tree, a young child of the forest, shall be your holy tree tonight. It is the wood of peace. See how it points upward to heaven? Let this be called the tree of the Christ child. Gather about it, not in the wildwood, but in your own homes. 
There it would shelter no deeds of blood, but loving gifts and rites of kindness. Another alteration of this legend says that after cutting the tree down, he had it hung upside down to represent the shape of the cross. Believe it or not, this practice continues today. People all across the world are catching on to this rediscovered trend, from homes, hotels, to museums. Even retail stores like Target are selling upside down Christmas trees. Whether or not this modern day trend stems directly from St. Boniface, I think we can all agree that everyone loves a good legend. Another possible origin for the Christmas tree was the paradise tree, popularized in the medieval plays about Adam and Eve. A paradise tree was a fir tree hung with apples, tinsel, gingerbread, and pretzels that represented the Garden of Eden. This most likely led to common German people setting up their own paradise trees in their homes on December 24th, the religious feast day of Adam and Eve. The first indoor tree was documented in Strasbourg, France in 1605. Documentation shows that trees then were often decorated with roses, sugar wafers, apples, and other sweet treats. Fast forward a few hundred years and the indoor decorated tree during the holidays was all the rage. But in the mid 1800s, there's a very specific origin of the modern decorated tree. In 1848, an image of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert was printed in the Illustrated London News. The image depicted the royals and their children standing around a decorated tree with gifts underneath. It's commonly believed that Prince Albert transplanted this tradition from his home country of Germany. A few years later, this same image was printed in Godey's Ladies Book, the most popular women's magazine of the day, under the title, The Christmas Tree. This single image solidified in popular culture the foundation of our Christmas tree today. The tradition of publicly lighting a massive tree is definitely an American tradition. This started on December 24th, 1923, on the grounds of the National Mall in Washington, D.C. This 60-foot fir tree became the first national Christmas tree and was covered in 2,500 electric lights. Shortly after, America's most famous public tree first went up at the Rockefeller Center in New York City. Since the building was still under construction in 1931 and had employed so many people during the Great Depression, the lighting of the Rockefeller tree soon became a symbol of hope for all New Yorkers. Ever since, the Christmas tree has become fundamental to our popular modern Christmas traditions. You can't live in America and go through the month of December without hearing the all too familiar sounds of ho, ho, ho. It's literally impossible. From songs on the radio to TV commercials for used car dealerships, Old St. Nick is probably America's longest and most prolific Christmas traditions. During the holidays, he dominates a majority of the secular Christmas imagery. But despite this obvious commercialization of Christmas, Santa Claus has a much stronger tie to our Christian faith than you might think. His evolution from the real Saint Nicholas to the Santa Claus we know today starts way back in the fourth century. Whether you call him Kris Kringle, Old Saint Nick, Father Christmas, or simply Santa Claus, he's obviously inescapable at Christmas time. But the Santa Claus we know today is nothing like the person he was based on. The original Saint Nick was around when the Christian church was merely a toddler. According to tradition, Nicholas was born in the 4th century in the Lycian coastal city of Patara in Asia Minor, near modern-day Demra, Turkey. In this small village, the young Nicholas was born to extremely wealthy parents who were very devout Christians and heavily involved in the church. As wealthy Christians, they had the means to tend to many poor, sick, and overlooked families. When Nicholas was still young, both of his parents passed away, possibly from a disease contracted from someone in their care. And thus, Nicholas inherited his parents' massive fortune. It's commonly believed that he spent the remainder of his formative years in the church, under the care of his uncle who was a priest in a nearby town. Nicholas committed his life to the church and was elected Bishop of Mira at an astonishingly young age. He continued his parents' philanthropic endeavors by tending to those in need and giving away his massive inheritance.
What's interesting is, despite being the patron saint of several countries and one of the most popular saints in the Eastern and Western churches, Nicholas's existence is not confirmed by any historical documents. The closest we get to any confirmation of his life is an early list making him an attendee of the First Council of Nicaea in the year 325 AD. This assembly of representatives were tasked with settling issues of Christianity, like the divinity of Christ, his relationship with God the Father, canon law, and the uniform observance of major religious feast days like Easter. The Council of Nicaea was basically figuring out the way the early church would operate, which was a big deal. And St. Nicholas was right in the middle of it all. Legend has it, during a heated debate, a man named Arius was arguing against the divine nature of Christ, claiming that Jesus was not equal to God the Father. Nicholas became so agitated that he walked right over to Arius and slaps him across the face for his blasphemy. Now, there's never really a good reason to slap someone upside the head, but if you have to, doing it over the divinity of Jesus is a pretty good reason. So how did we get from WWE St. Nicholas to old jolly St. Nick? It starts, of course, with children. Another famous legend tells how he resurrected three children who had been murdered and placed in a barrel to be pickled in brine by a desperate butcher trying to pass them off as pork during a famine. This earned him the reputation as a protector of children. Now, this brings us to his most famous legend, and one that would go on to inspire the modern day version of Old Saint Nick. The legend says that one night, in order to remain anonymous, he snuck onto the roof of a house and dropped a bag of gold down the chimney to a father with three daughters. Without this gift, the father wouldn't have been able to afford the payment of his three daughters' marriage dowries. They would have most likely been sold into slavery or had to support themselves through a life of prostitution, as was the norm for unmarried women in the fourth century. After his death, this act of generosity would become renowned worldwide. It's also thought to have started the tradition of hanging stockings above your chimney to give old Saint Nick a place to put his gifts of gold. If you're like many families, you have the tradition of putting fruit, like oranges, in your stockings. Ever wonder how that tradition started? Well, the oranges are said to represent the gold pieces that St. Nicholas dropped down the chimney that fateful night. So how do we get from pickled children and marriage dowries to the most famous mythological figure of all time, Santa Claus? It happened during the Reformation. St. Nicholas died on December 6th, 343 a day which is still observed in many parts of the world as St. Nicholas Day. Following his death, he was buried in the cathedral in Mira. His body was moved to avoid desecration by the invading Muslim forces and was taken to Bari, Italy, where the majority of his body remains today. A church was built around them and was dedicated in 1089. They finished the work on it about a hundred years later. His remains being brought to Italy greatly increased his popularity and his legends started taking on a life of their own. Nuns and church clergy all throughout Europe were inspired by the stories of St. Nick's generosity and started delivering gifts and baskets of treats around Christmas time to the less fortunate, delivering them anonymously. When people asked where the gifts came from, the response would always be, it must have been St. Nick. This became a tradition all around Europe for the next several hundred years. During the 16th century came the Protestant Reformation. Protestant clergy opposed the veneration of saints like Nicholas. This caused Saint Nick to be disguised in cultural folklore as a figure called Pelsnickel. This figure was a sort of grumpy, fur-clad gift bringer. While Saint Nicholas delivered gifts to good children on December 6th, Pelsnickel brought them on December 24th thus connecting St. Nick's Day to Christmas. The common belief is that the story of St. Nicholas was brought to America by the Dutch Puritans from Holland. Here, St. Nicholas's name shifted to Santa Claus. As the Dutch speakers slowly intertwined with the English-speaking colonies, the saint's name became an alteration of the Dutch pronunciation, Sinterklaas. The image of Santa we know today was developed throughout the 1800s and into the early 1900s. In 1809, Washington Irving portrayed St. Nicholas in his satirical book, History of New York, as a plump Dutchman smoking a clay pipe, flying through the sky in a wagon, dropping gifts down chimneys. In 1823, 
Clement Clark Moore penned the poem A Visit from St. Nicholas, which brought us a little closer to the Santa we know today. He traded the wagon for a sleigh drawn by eight tiny reindeer. Finally, in 1879, the cartoonist Thomas Nass published a series of pictures of a rotund and jolly St. Nicholas. He was the first to suggest that Santa lived not in Mira, Turkey, Holland, or even Austria, but at the North Pole. Nast's work had a massive influence in forming the American Santa Claus. By the start of the 1900s, America started seeing a standard jolly Santa. He was portrayed by dozens of artists, including Norman Rockwell, with a big red fur-trimmed suit. But in 1931, nothing standardized the image of Santa Claus quite like the Coca-Cola Santa advertisements. Thus, the iconic image of the contemporary Santa Claus was solidified. And the rest is history. That's how a kind, generous saint from the Middle East became the jolly old Saint Nick we know today. It seems like the day after Thanksgiving, you start hearing Christmas music everywhere. Whether you embrace it or not, there really is something about Christmas music that puts you in the holiday spirit. Whether it's jingle bells dashing through the snow or it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, it's hard to not sing along to your favorite Christmas tunes. But did you know that perhaps one of the most famous Christmas carols of all time, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, didn't even have angels in the original version? Yeah, no angels. Charles Wesley, born this month in history, wrote some of the most famous hymns of all time, like Jesus, lover of my soul, love divine, all loves excelling, and Christ the Lord is risen today. Wesley also penned, hark the herald angels sing, but originally the song didn't even include its most famous character, the angels. Charles and John Wesley are known as the founders of Methodism. Though Charles's brother John is considered the organizational genius behind the founding of Methodism, without the hymns of Charles, the Methodist movement may have faded into history. As one historian put it, the early Methodists were taught and led as much through Charles's hymns as through sermons in John Wesley's pamphlets. With a master's degree in classical languages and literature, it is no surprise that Charles had a gift for writing poetry. His gift grew exponentially after his spiritual awakening and his missionary journeys with his brother John to the colonies. In 1789, Charles published his first volume of hymns and sacred poems. The book contained the now famous Christmas carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. It's perhaps one of the most familiar and popular Christmas carols of all time. And although he's responsible for other verses in the songs, Wesley did not pin the opening line of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. In fact, the song that Wesley originally wrote was titled, Hymn for Christmas Day. It began, Hark how all the welkin rings. Yeah, that's right, a welkin. No herald angels in Wesley's original hymn, just a ringing welkin. In case you're wondering, welkin was a common word in Old English. For instance, it shows up 18 times in Shakespeare plays, but nobody sings Shakespeare at Christmas. Welkin refers to what we might call the vault or the ceiling of heaven, the place where the stars and the angels dwell. It's quite likely that Wesley was thinking of the angels in Luke 2 when he referred to the ringing Welkin, especially given the song's use of glory and peace on earth. So how did we move from Welkin to angels? It was one of the Wesley brothers' friends and fellow revivalist George Whitfield who made the change. George Whitfield was one of the greatest revivalists during the Great Awakening. He is believed to have preached at least 18,000 times to perhaps 10 million listeners in Great Britain and the American colonies. Whitfield would enthrall large crowds through a potent combination of drama, religious rhetoric, and patriotism. It was Whitfield's suggestion to change the first line of Hymn for Christmas Day to heart the herald angels sing, Glory to the Newborn King. Wesley did not originally appreciate this change to his hymn, but regardless, Whitfield's version soon became the standard version and was printed and published in hymnals all around the world. Whitfield's change explains the extraordinary popularity of the Christmas Carol as we know it today. Perhaps this Christmas, you'll have an opportunity to join with the angels in the welkin 
singing glory to the newborn king. We're all very familiar with the tradition of smooching under the mistletoe. You've undoubtedly seen the tradition used in movies or TV. It may not be as popular as holly or fresh garland, but it's among the pantheon of all Christmas plants. The plant has even made its way into a number of classic holiday songs. The use of mistletoe can be traced back for thousands of years to the Celtic Druids in the first century. It was seen as a sacred symbol of vivacity and fertility because the Druids saw it blooming in the trees during the harsh winters. The plant itself is a parasitic growth on trees transferred by birds through their droppings. Mistletoe grows and steals water and other nutrients from its host. But to make things worse, the origins of the name is derived from two Anglo-Saxon words, mistel, meaning dung, and tan, meaning stick or twig. So basically, you can directly translate that word to poop stick. According to a famous story in Norse mythology, the romantic overtones started with the goddess of love, who vowed to plant a kiss on all those who passed beneath it. Mistletoe then became associated with fertility throughout the Middle Ages, and by the 18th century, it had become widely incorporated into Christmas celebrations. Exactly how it made its way from a sacred Celtic herb to a holiday decoration, like a lot of origin stories, is up for debate. But it's commonly believed that the kissing tradition started to catch on among the servants class in England before spreading throughout all of European society. Anybody was allowed to steal a kiss from someone caught standing under mistletoe, and refusing it was seen as bad luck. Another tradition said to pluck a single berry from the mistletoe with each kiss, and once all the berries were gone, the smooching had to stop. The tradition spread quickly throughout the world, beginning as a tradition that remains today. So, the next time you find yourself puckering up under the mistletoe, try not to think about poop on a stick. Other than holiday hymns, it just doesn't quite feel like Christmas without receiving like a ton of Christmas cards, right? Even in the age of social media and email, sending physical Christmas cards is a holiday favorite. According to Hallmark, 1.3 billion Christmas cards are sent every year in the United States alone. What better way to share our holiday joy with people that didn't quite make it to Christmas dinner than with a unique Christmas card? Like most of our beloved customs, the credit of this unique tradition goes to a man from England in the 1800s, commercially way ahead of his time, Sir Henry Cole. Henry Cole was a prominent educator and patron of the arts. Cole traveled in the elite social circles of early Victorian England and, according to him, had the great misfortune of having too many friends. The problem came to a climax during the holiday season of 1843. All of those friends were giving Cole a headache. The problem, an old custom in England, Christmas letters. The Christmas and New Year's letter had received a new energy with the recent expansion of the British postal system. All thanks to the introduction of the penny post. This stamp allowed a sender to dispatch a letter or card anywhere in the country by simply affixing a penny stamp to the envelope. And now, thanks to the penny post, everyone was sending letters. Henry Cole was an enthusiastic supporter of the new postal system, and because of his newfound fame for forming the Victorian Albert Museum in London, he enjoyed being an 1840s English celebrity. But unfortunately, he was a busy man, and in high demand. In Victoria, England, it was considered rude not to answer mail, and Sir Henry Cole had a lot of it. In his home, he watched as stacks of unanswered correspondence piled up. For a man who enjoyed communicating with his friends, he worried over what to do. Then it hit him, an ingenious idea. He approached an artist friend and asked him to design a piece of artwork that he had in mind. Cole used a threefold design. In the center, a family enjoying a Christmas dinner, and on either side, images of people caring for the poor. Cole then took the illustration and had a thousand copies made by a London printer. This month in history, in the year 1843, the first Christmas card was printed on a piece of stiff cardboard, five and one eighths by three and a quarter inches in size. At the top of each was the salutation, allowing Cole to personalize his responses, which included the generic greeting, a Merry Christmas 
and a happy new year to you. Within a few years, several other prominent Victorian celebrities simply copied Cole's creation and began sending Christmas cards of their own. While Cole gets the credit for the first, it took several decades for the Christmas card to really catch on, both in Great Britain and the United States. Once it did, it became an integral part of our holiday season. In the United States, the story is a little different. Louis Prang was a Prussian immigrant with a print shop near Boston. In 1875, the first Christmas card printed in the United States was very different from Cole's 30 years earlier. The card was a painting of a flower that simply read, Merry Christmas. But in the United States and in England, the quality and popularity of the cards grew in the late 1800s. This started an entirely new trend. Much like collecting baseball cards or comic books, it became wildly popular to collect Christmas cards. Even newspapers would review and rank the new best, most collectible designs. This was mostly spurred on by competitions organized by card publishers, with cash prizes offered for the best Christmas card designs. In 1915, the modern Christmas card industry arguably began when a Kansas City-based failing postcard company published its first holiday card. The Hall Brothers Company, which a decade later would change their company name to Hallmark, adapted a format for the cards. Four inches wide, six inches high, folded once and inserted in an envelope. This new format changed the industry and remains the standard. Now Christmas cards are filled with reindeer, red-suited Santas, elves, and skylines of ancient Bethlehem. As demand for Christmas cards increased, Hallmark and its competitors began to commission famous artists to design them. Soon, cards designed by the finest artists of the time, like Salvador Dali, Grandma Moses, and Norman Rockwell were filling mantles of homes all across America. From Henry Cole to Hallmark, the sentiment of the Christmas card remains the same. A way to reach out and share the Christmas spirit with those you love. If there's one tradition that brings us closer together and fills our hearts with hope during the Christmas season, it's not cheesy Hallmark movies, but our beautiful Christmas hymns. From such humble origins, these melodies have developed to a level that our artists, musicians, and composers would find just simply unbelievable. Much like Hark the Herald Angels Sing, our next hymn has topped the Christmas hymn charts for over two centuries. Silent Night is one of the most beloved hymns of all time and one that pretty much defines the true meaning of Christmas. The song, which features a lullaby-like melody and a simple message of peace, seems potent today as it likely did in a small Salzburg church two centuries ago. Gathered together for a Christmas mass in 1818, a small Austrian congregation of St. Nicholas Church listened to Silent Night for the very first time. Originally written in German in 1816, a young priest named Father Joseph Moore had written the lyrics as a six-stanza poem while working at a pilgrimage church in Marifar, Austria. He called the poem Stille Nacht, Heilige Nacht, or Silent Night, Holy Night. Two years later, Moore wanted it set to music so it could be performed for an audience that Christmas. The day before Christmas in 1818, Moore traveled to the nearby village of Arnsdorf, Austria to ask teacher and organist Franz Gruber if he could compose music to accompany the lyrics. He told Gruber he wanted to perform it that night for the Christmas Eve Mass. Gruber got to work and the music was written for the song in just a few hours that same day. What made this song so different was that in Germany in the 1800s, hymns and songs were regularly played on church organs. Silent Night, however, was composed for just two voices and a single acoustic guitar. There are many different myths about why it was limited to just voice and guitar, but one of the most popular rumors was that a hungry mouse damaged the organ so badly that it rendered the church organ useless that Christmas season. While some believe this to be untrue, it sure makes for a fun story. Over the next two decades, the song's popularity spread all throughout Europe. Carl Muracher, an organ builder who serviced the St. Nicholas Church, loved the Christmas carols so much that he made a copy of the sheet music and took it home with him to Zillertal, Austria. In Zillertal, two families of popular folk singers, the Strassers and the Rainers, began including the hymn in their performances. 
The musical family traveled throughout Europe, eventually performing for royal audiences, including performances for the Emperor of Austria, Franz I, and another for the Tsar of Russia, Alexander I. The same family was also the first to take it across the Atlantic and perform the carol in the United States, New York City, in 1839. From there, its popularity grew even more. Silent Night became a sensation around the world. Its significance made UNESCO declare it a part of the world's intangible cultural heritage and has been translated into roughly 140 different languages. But perhaps the most influential translation of the song was into English in 1859. John Freeman Young, an Episcopal priest in New York City, wrote and published the English translation of Silent Night. While much of the translation stayed very close to the original, the first six verses of Gruber's carol were changed substantially. In the English version, we're familiar with the lyrics, Silent Night, Holy Night. All is calm, all is bright. Round young virgin, mother and child. Holy infant, so tender and mild sleep in heavenly peace. The direct German translation would be silent night, holy night. Everything is sleeping. Lonely wakes only the faithful sacrosanct couple. Gentle boy in curly hair, sleep in heavenly peace. The English translation by the Episcopalian priest focused on the virgin mother and the child in a different way than the original. The lyrics of Silent Night have always carried an important message for Christmas Eve observance around the world. But the song's simple melody and peaceful lyrics also reminds us of a universal sense of peace that transcends the holiday. Perhaps at no other time in the song's history was the message more important than during the First World War. Just over a century ago, while World War I was raging in Europe, young men were being slaughtered by the hundreds of thousands. But somehow, on Christmas Eve, the guns briefly fell silent. One account from a German officer said, on Christmas Eve at noon, fire ceased completely on both fronts. A British soldier said, we heard a German singing, in German, naturally. The Germans placed candles on their trenches and on Christmas trees, then continued the celebration by singing Christmas carols, particularly Silent Night, a tune the British knew and responded by singing the carol in their own language. The two sides continued by shouting Christmas greetings to each other. Soon after, there were excursions across no man's land, where small gifts were exchanged, like food, tobacco, and souvenirs. The song's fundamental message of peace in the midst of sufferings bridged even the ravages of World War I. Today, Silent Night still tops the charts of Christmas records and sales every year. Silent Night offers comfort and solace to anyone in need of peace. The song speaks of hope and beauty that arises out of pain. Our next chart-topping hymn sings of the very town where Silent Night took place. O Little Town of Bethlehem is celebrated as one of the most well-known and simple hymns of the Christmas season. It originated as a poem written for Sunday schoolers just a few years after the American Civil War. The words written by Philip Brooks echo the themes of stillness and peace in the aftermath of the war. Brooks was a dynamic preacher in Philadelphia, and while still in his 20s, he rose in prominence as he preached forcefully against slavery during the Civil War. During battles, Brooks would extend his ministry to African-American troops in nearby training camps, advocated equal rights for freedmen, and became an active part of abolition. At the end of four years of war, Brooks movingly eulogized Abraham Lincoln and the soldiers who gave their lives. Brooks found the inspiration for his hymn after the war when he traveled to the Holy Land in 1866. During one starry Christmas Eve night, he visited Bethlehem, the birthplace of Jesus. The experience of walking through the shepherd's field and coming upon the skyline of the little Palestinian town inspired him. Brooks returned to Philadelphia in September the following year, but it wasn't until three years later that he would reflect on his walk that Christmas Eve night. He sat down and in just a few hours wrote the poem, O Little Town of Bethlehem, remembering what he had seen and felt in the Holy Land. That week, Brooke went to his organist, Louis Redner, to put the words to music. 
Brooks told Redner that he had written a simple little carol for the Sunday school service at Christmas and wanted him to write a tune for it. Redner recalled later that Mr. Brooks came to me on Friday and said, Redner, have you ground out that music yet to O Little Town of Bethlehem? I replied, no, but that he should have it by Sunday. By Saturday night, Redner was still struggling to find the tune, but was roused from sleep late in the night, hearing an angel strain whispering in my ear. Redner reported that he retrieved a piece of music paper and jotted down the treble of the tune that he had dreamed. The next morning, the music filled the church. Neither Redner nor Brooks had any idea the popularity the song would have. From Elvis to church choirs around the world, the simple, peaceful song that reminds us all of that still sweet night will be on the lips of people everywhere this Christmas. Candy cane stripes seem to decorate everything during the holidays. The little peppermint stick is as much an ornament as it is a tasty treat. Kids and adults alike consume approximately 1.7 billion of these candy treats during the holidays. But exactly how and when did the candy cane get its start? Well, that story is a bit more uncertain than their worldwide popularity. An early legend of its origins starts in the 1670s. A choir master at Cologne Cathedral in Germany was trying to figure out a way for his young, restless singers to sit still through the dreadfully long Christmas nativity service. Rather than whacking them with a switch, as was the custom then, he incentivized them with a sugar stick to keep them quiet and occupied. For the Christmas occasion, he had them bent into the shape of a staff to represent the shepherds that visited the baby Jesus that very first Christmas. From Germany, candy canes spread to other parts of Europe, where they would have been commonly handed out during the holidays, thus becoming associated with Christmas. The first documented candy stick comes from Boston, Massachusetts in 1837. They started as straight white sugar sticks, and a few years later, the red stripes were added. The English term candy cane and their association with Christmas didn't start becoming popular in America until the latter part of the 19th century, 200 years after they had supposedly been invented. This leads to many disputes in the exact origins of the Christmas tree. But in 1919, a company out of Albany, Georgia, started making candy canes. In 1924, the company became simply known as Bob's Candy Company. They were the first to wrap them individually in cellophane and today have become the largest manufacturer of striped candy in the world. There are a ton of Christianized meanings that can be added to the simplicity of the candy cane. The alternating three stripes representing the Holy Trinity and the solid red stripe can represent Jesus' blood. The white part is the purity that Jesus' blood purchased for us on the cross. The J shape can represent Jesus' name or the staff of the Good Shepherd. The sugar can even represent the sweetness of his love for us. We'd all love to believe that these were the original intentions when creating the candy cane, but whether you eat them starting with the straight end first or the curved end, the fact remains, the holidays just aren't quite the same without those little minty Christmas treats. While Christmas shopping this year, you will definitely come across the famous red bucket and the sound of a gentle bell ringing outside your favorite retail store. This friendly call for donations during the Christmas season can be recognized as none other than the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army is one of the most recognized charities and nonprofits in the world, and its origins are just as devout as its ministry. Created by William Booth of Nottingham, England, and his wife, Catherine, the Christian charitable organization, the Salvation Army, is known for being one of the world's largest donors of humanitarian aid. With social aid, they've reached millions, especially in the United States and the UK. One of the most recognizable deeds of the organization during the Christmas season would be the iconic red kettle and the smiling volunteers stationed for fundraising outside retail stores and public places across the world. In the U.S., over 25,000 volunteers ring a bell requesting your Christmas spirit to drop a few coins into the kettle as you go about your holiday shopping. But this Red Kettle Army didn't begin until this month in history, in 1891. In San Francisco, Salvation Army Captain Joseph McPhee was distraught because so many poor individuals in San Francisco were going hungry. During the holiday season that year, he resolved to provide a free Christmas dinner for the destitute and poverty-stricken. He only had one major hurdle to overcome, 
funding the project. As McPhee lay awake at night, he worried and prayed about how he would be able to find the funds to fulfill his commitment of feeding 1,000 of the city's poorest individuals on Christmas. As McPhee pondered the issue, he thought back to his sailor days in Liverpool. He remembered seeing a large black iron kettle set up on the dock into which passerbys tossed a coin or two to help the poor. The idea struck him. Would it work in San Francisco? Would the public be just as kind as the sailors in Liverpool? The next day, Captain McPhee went down to Oakland Ferry Landing at the foot of Market Street. He secured permission from the authorities to place a large iron cooking pot at the Oakland Ferry Landing. He found a way to secure the pot so that it was hanging in a conspicuous position so that all those going to and from the ferry boats would see it. Beside the pot, he placed a sign that read, Keep the pot boiling. McPhee stood by and encouraged passersby to drop coins in the pot to help the poor. That day, to his surprise, hundreds of people passed the pot and donated a little bit of money each. As the pot filled, so did the faith of McPhee. Soon, he had enough money to feed the needy people of San Francisco at Christmas. The story of McPhee's fundraising success spread throughout the Salvation Army. And six years later, the Red Kettle idea swept the country from San Francisco to Boston. In 1897, the combined nationwide effort resulted in 150,000 Christmas dinners for the needy. But it wasn't until the turn of the century that the Army introduced the iconic sound that would go alongside the Red Kettle. In 1900, Salvation Army officer cadet Amelia Kunkel was a kettle worker in New York City. At just 16 years old, in her navy blue uniform, red ribbon trimmed bonnet and skirt scraping the sidewalk, she waited patiently for donations. Later, in an interview about the story, Amelia recalled that it was a very cold, damp day as she waited near Wall Street by the L with her assigned black kettle. She said the L brought droves of businessmen to and from the financial district. Some contributed to the Salvation Army kettle, most just passed by. In those days, the average donation was small, just a nickel or a dime, sometimes a quarter, occasionally a dollar. In 1900, a good afternoon would bring in donations totaling $18. Amelia said, most days, I was disappointed that people ignored me and my kettle. As the story goes, one day, Amelia complained to her supervisor, Major Chadwell, an administrator. Amelia felt that just standing there wasn't garnering enough donations. So Major Chadwell suggested Amelia do something. His first suggestion was that she find a stick and bang on the kettle to draw attention. Amelia didn't like that idea. When she said no, he replied, well then, Cadet Kunkel, you'll certainly solve that problem all by yourself before long. The next day, Amelia was shopping in a nearby Woolworth's Five and Dime store. She found just what she was looking for, a little bell. As she picked it up, the little bell gave a little jingle. She bought the bell for just 10 cents. That day, Amelia rang the bell by her kettle, and more people stopped. She greeted each contribution with a cheery, God bless you, and Merry Christmas, and it changed the Salvation Army forever. Her idea spread like wildfire. Soon, cadets around the country were ringing bells, raising funds for the Salvation Army's Christmas dinner. In 1901, kettle contributions in New York City provided funds for the first mammoth sit-down dinner in Madison Square Garden, a custom that continued for many years. Today in the U.S., the Salvation Army assists more than 4.5 million people during the Thanksgiving and Christmas season. Captain McPhee's kettle and cadet Amelia's bell launched a tradition that has spread not just through the United States, but across the world. Kettles are now used in Korea, Japan, Chile, and many European countries. Everywhere, public contributions to Salvation Army kettles enable the organization to continue its year-round efforts, helping those who would otherwise be forgotten. In its milestone 125th year, the Red Kettle Campaign set a new national fundraising record. Some 25,000 bell ringers raised $149.6 million for the campaign, with all money going to work directly in the community where it was raised. This month, bell ringers of all ages and backgrounds will continue to brave the cold and the crowds at Christmas time, united in their resolve to raise money and help the less fortunate. 
This month is all about charity, love, and of course, celebrating the birth of our Savior Jesus. He's the reason for the season. Although we can sometimes get caught up in the hustle bustle of the commercialized Christmas season, it's always good to remember how much of these traditions are rooted in our Christian faith. It feels good to remember that our modern day traditions aren't so modern at all. As secularized as people have tried to make the holiday season, it turns out you can't quite take the Christ out of Christmas. I hope you've enjoyed looking back at what happened this month in Christian history. What I love about studying the past is that one moment in time can open up loads of incredible history. No matter how much life we've lived, we can all learn so much from the believers that have gone before us. The peaks and valleys that they endured can prepare us to pioneer our own paths. But most of all, they can inspire us to trust in the God who holds all of history in his hands. I'm Cody Crouch. I hope you'll join me next time on This Month in Christian History. Until then, go make some history of your own.